You might think that in the age of powerful trucks, GPS, and satellite communication, designing a vehicle to cross the Arctic would be easy. But some of the boldest expedition vehicles ever planned for the frozen north never made it. Cancelled, failed, or abandoned. What went wrong? You're about to hear wild stories of ambition, miscalculation, ice cold, and machines breaking under extremes. Stick around. By the end, you'll see just how hard conquering the Arctic really is, and which cancelled project surprises you most. Imagine this. A team in a workshop. Pencils and drawings strewn everywhere, dreaming of a vehicle that can roll over sea ice, deep snow, shifting ice flows. They promise it will push into places never reached, carry scientists, supplies, maybe even house them inside. They call it the future of polar mobility. But somewhere between dream and ice, disaster strikes, tires crack, motors freeze, budgets vanish. One by one, grand plans fall apart. Let's start with the most famous of them, the Antarctic Snow Cruiser. Yes, this is technically for Antarctica, but its lessons echo in Arctic planning. In the late 1930s, a U.S. team under Thomas Poulter designed a giant machine, nicknamed the Penguin, to operate like a mobile base on ice. It was 75,000 pounds, had living quarters, labs, even a built-in airplane hangar. They thought, if this works in Antarctica, Arctic versions would follow. They shipped it, deployed it, and immediately ran into trouble. The tires, smooth so snow wouldn't cling, had no grip. The vehicle often had to be driven backward because that gave better traction. It was so ungainly and impractical in real polar terrain that it was abandoned, left under snow. And now its final resting place is unknown. The lesson, designing for ice is one thing, surviving it in real life is another. Now come more modern attempts aimed for the Arctic. One little-known project was the Land Rover Wolf series prepared for the Trans-Global Arctic Expedition. These vehicles were heavily modified. 24-volt electrics, insulated cabins, special gear, and painted in gold livery. But just days before they were to depart, the expedition was cancelled. The vehicles sat unused and were later auctioned. That dream of a cross-Arctic ride was halted not by ice, but by logistics, funding, or shifting priorities. Think that's mundane? Next, we have the story of Africar. Though not designed purely for polar use, the Africar project intended a rugged vehicle that could traverse from the Arctic Circle through Scandinavia down to Africa. Its aim was bold, a car that could handle snow, ice, and desert. But it floundered under financial pressures. Only six were ever made. In 1988, the company ceased trading. The ambition was huge, but money and reality closed in. You see the pattern. Even when the design is clever, real constraints, money, engineering, terrain surprises, kill dreams. But there are more exotic failures. Some projects never got past paper. Imagine vehicles with wheels that double as tracks, or hybrid systems switching from wheels to skis. Engineers drew up plans full of promise, but when materials cost soared and tests failed, these never left the drawing board. It's hard to find details. Sometimes they stay in archives or prototype labs unseen by public eyes. In the Cold War era, the Soviets considered extremely heavy off-road machines for polar research, but many were quietly shelved. Sometimes the vehicles would have required infrastructure, fuel depots, roads that didn't exist. The machine might be amazing, but if you can't feed it or maintain it, it fails. But if you thought those early attempts were clumsy, wait until you see what happened in the 1960s and 70s, when big industries and governments tried to outsmart nature with pure engineering muscle. One of the most ambitious Arctic off-road projects ever conceived was the Snow Freighter. Built by Lee Tourneau in the 1950s for the US military, this was basically a land train. Imagine six giant connected trailers each with its own powered wheels, stretching nearly 300 feet long. It was supposed to carry supplies across Alaska's ice roads and tundra, where normal trucks couldn't go. At first, it seemed unstoppable. Those massive low-pressure tires could float over soft ground, and each wheel had its own electric motor powered by a diesel generator and a lead unit. On paper, it was genius. But in real life, the Arctic bit back. The weight proved too much for fragile permafrost. 
The train sank, snapped joints, and struggled with snowdrifts that could bury a building. When it broke down in the wild, it was almost impossible to recover. After just a few runs, the US military scrapped the project. The remaining snow freighter was left rusting in the Alaskan wilderness, now a ghost of impossible ambition. Then came the TC-497 overland train, also designed by Le Tourneau. This was the ultimate evolution of the snow freighter dream, a 570-foot-long diesel-electric behemoth powered by jet-derived turbines. It was meant to haul tons of cargo across polar deserts and remote areas without needing roads or rails. Engineers called it the train that could conquer the Earth. It actually worked in desert testing, but by the time it was ready for Arctic trials, the U.S. Army switched focus to air transport and helicopters. Roads improved. The train was obsolete before it even rolled onto the ice. Only the lead control car survives today, parked at the Yuma Proving Ground Museum. It's a monument to a canceled dream, a technological marvel that lost the timing race. But the Soviets weren't far behind in dreaming big. They built monstrous off-roaders like the Zeal 2906 and Zeal 4904, designed for rescue missions in Siberia's most hostile terrains. The Zeal 2906 looked like something from a sci-fi film, twin screw-propelled cylinders that could swim through water, mud, and snow. It worked, but it was so expensive and specialized that only a handful were made. Its Arctic variant, a larger expedition version, was canceled before mass deployment because of funding and the sheer impracticality of maintaining it in the field. Still, its smaller brothers served in limited rescue roles and inspired later experimental snow crawlers. Now jump to the 1980s. The oil boom brought a new generation of Arctic exploration vehicles, funded by petroleum giants chasing northern resources. One fascinating concept was the Arctos craft, an articulated amphibious vehicle with twin hulls connected by a hinge. It could float in water and crawl over ice ridges or broken sea ice. The first working versions were built and even used in Canada's Beaufort Sea. But an even larger expedition-grade version was proposed for full Arctic crossing missions, a floating research and logistics platform on wheels and tracks. That model was canceled in the planning stage when costs skyrocketed. Each unit would have cost as much as a small ship, and fuel logistics in the Arctic made it impossible to sustain. Another ambitious attempt came from Sweden, the Volvo Laplander 903 Arctic Project. This was meant to be a cold-weather evolution of the Laplander military vehicle, redesigned for multi-continent expeditions. It had insulation, modular cabins, and heating systems integrated into the chassis. But during trials near Kiruna, engineers found the drivetrain couldn't handle the constant freezing and thawing. Gearboxes seized, rubber parts cracked, and heaters couldn't keep up. The project quietly disappeared from Volvo's lineup and only a few prototypes remain in museums. Meanwhile, Canada had its own big dream, the foremost Husky exploration truck. Foremost was known for building vehicles with massive flotation tires. They pitched the Husky as the ultimate Arctic science truck, able to carry labs and personnel hundreds of miles from base camps. The prototype was completed, but mechanical failures during cold testing were relentless frozen hydraulics, diesel gelling, and control cables snapping. In the 1990s, when budgets tightened, the Husky project was shelved. The concept later evolved into smaller models that still serve in Arctic logistics today, but the grand vision, the moving Arctic lab, was lost. And then there was the Project Ice Challenger from the early 2000s, a British team attempting to drive a heavily modified six-wheel vehicle across the frozen Arctic Ocean. The machine, part Humvee, part amphibious truck, was built for glory, a blend of survival, adventure, and record-breaking. But soon after trials began, the expedition was canceled due to insurance, cost overruns, and environmental safety concerns. The vehicle was never fully tested on the pack ice. Instead, it was shown at events and later auctioned off, becoming a symbol of adventure halted by bureaucracy. See the pattern yet? It's not just engineering that fails in the Arctic, it's human systems too. Funding, politics, timing, even small design assumptions can kill a project that looks perfect on paper. But wait till you see what happened with the next machines, because some of them were canceled not by failure but by success. You won't believe this. 
In the 2010s, as new materials, electric motors, and AI systems arrived, engineers built prototypes that actually worked beautifully. But they were so good that investors feared they'd disrupt established logistics businesses. One example, an autonomous hybrid Arctic rover developed by a Scandinavian startup. It used solar panels, internal heating, and smart navigation to travel hundreds of kilometers unattended. The demo went flawlessly, and then canceled. The company folded under strategic restructuring. Insiders whispered that major stakeholders pulled funding, afraid that the robot could replace conventional snowcat services. And that's the twist no one expects. Sometimes failure isn't mechanical, it's political. But keep watching because the next three cancellations are even stranger. One of them involves a vehicle built to move icebergs. Another, a project that aimed to live inside a mobile Arctic dome. And the last, well, it might just be the wildest what-if vehicle in expedition history.